Um, I will be uh, talking about the new project I'm embarked on now, but it is a sequel to the last book I wrote. So I will need to divide my time a little bit between that book to give you what you need to think, uh, to understand where I'm going in my new work. Um, and through the centuries, scholars of divine law in Western culture have had great difficulty accounting for the Talmud and the Talmud's conception of divine law. And that's because the Talmud's conception of divine law doesn't align with the prevailing scholarly definition of divine law. That scholarly definition draws on the Greek philosophical conception of divine law as an absolute and immutable law that transcends history. But as I argued in my last book, What's Divine About Divine Law, the Talmudic rabbis understood divine law as a dynamic and contingent phenomenon that unfolds in and through historical time. And so scholars have had trouble accounting for that. So in my lecture today, I want to do two things. First, I will briefly review the argument of my last book for what Talmudic divine law is not. Right? I will show that the rabbis broke with the Greek philosophical tradition's conception of divine law as an immutable rational order that transcends history and its contingency. And then second, I will preview the argument of the book I'm currently writing, which provides a positive account of um, what Talmudic divine law is. So first what it is not and then what it is. And I will argue that the alternative Talmudic conception of divine law in which history and contingency play a vital role is best illuminated by deploying such modern theoretical lenses as humor theory, performance studies, and theories of play. So to begin with a negative argument for what Talmudic law is not, we must review the conception of divine law that emerged from the Greek philosophical tradition, especially from the Stoics, because it was a popular version of their view that would pervade the Hellenistic and later Roman East um, and would become a mainstay of Christian theology and eventually enter the Western intellectual and academic tradition. So responding to the sophists uh, who attacked law and morality as mere convention, as conventional and arbitrary. The Stoics wanted to base law and morality on something secure, something transcending mere human convention. And so they chose nature. And that broke with a long Greek tradition that for the most part had seen nature, Fusus, as chaotic and antithetical to law. Law was what saved us from the chaos of nature. But against that older tradition, the Stoics asserted that nature was not chaotic and disordered. It was governed by an inherent reason or logos. Now for the Stoics, God was nature, nature is divine. So the reason inherent in nature, the natural law was divine law, theos nomos, an unwritten rational order that animates and governs the cosmos. By definition, this rational order transcends historical time. It's universal, it's immutable, it's true. It's not historically conditioned or contingent. Um, I'm just gonna be sharing my screen for some of this. So I hope everyone can, can see that and please let me know if you cannot. Um, but Cicero would give his account of the Stoic conception of divine law. True law is right reason in agreement with nature, diffused over everyone, consistent, everlasting. We cannot be absolved from this law by Senate or people, nor need we look for any outside interpreter of it or commentator. And there will not be a different law at Rome and at and Athens or a different law now and in the future, but one law, everlasting and immutable, will hold good for all peoples and all times. So according to the Stoics, the, perfect, the perfectly rational person or sage who perceives the divine logos or order embedded in nature can achieve virtue through his own rational nature. But perfectly rational sages are an ideal, very rare. And in general, humans lack the rational perfection that they need to perceive the divine logos or order in nature that is the source of true virtue. And so instead we have to institute written laws, a second best accommodation to our rational imperfection. And these written laws just coerce us to a basic civility, not true rational virtue. So the Stoics consistent with Greek political philosophy generally distinguished divine law on the one hand, the rational order permeating the cosmos from human positive law. On the other hand, the written legislation and rules of political states that are particular, they're not universal, they're grounded in and backed by the will of a sovereign authority rather than universal reason. 
And these human laws are not necessarily true, right? I don't stop at a red light because stopping at redness is a universal rational truth. We've just agreed to do that by convention. Positive human laws are historically conditioned and contingent. They change in response to the inevitably shifting circumstances of life in this material world of generation and decay. And while we should aspire to bring our human laws into accord with natural reason under the guidance of the rational sage, who governed by reason is himself a kind of living law, a nomos and psychos, this still remains always an aspiration. By definition, no written law represents the divine logos. Written laws are historically embedded, particular, contingent, and human by definition. The divine law is unwritten by definition because it is logos or reason itself. It's by definition transhistorical, universal, and absolute. And that binary of the unwritten divine law and the written human legislation of political states is basic to all Hellenistic conceptions of law. And I've represented it in this, whoops, this chart, whoops. So on the left, you see the characteristics of divine natural law according to Greek thought. Um, this is a position that permeates the Hellenistic East, East that divine law is the transhistorical, unwritten logos that's embedded in nature. It is therefore true, it is universal, it is absolute, it is immutable. And it is therefore distinct from human positive law on the right hand column B. No human law, which is historically conditioned uh, and written legislation grounded in the will of a sovereign and conventional and particular to a given society and contingent and mutable by his, through historical time, no human law can claim to be divine law. They are just by definition different. Uh, these, this would just be a contradiction in terms. So you can probably see where I'm going with this or where I went with this in my previous book, because there is, of course, an alternative tradition of divine law in antiquity that claimed precisely what the Greek philosophical tradition would reject out of hand. The biblical conception of divine law is a body of written positive legislation given not to universal humankind, but to a particular people at Sinai, the Israelites, in order to enable the establishment of a political community in a particular place, the land of Israel. The Mosaic law is said to be divine in biblical tradition, not because it has the characteristics of column A here, not because it's the unwritten and universal rational order of the cosmos. It's divine because it's authored by a deity. It is the command of a deity. So to say it is divine is to point to its source, not to its character as rational or true or universal or immutable. Certainly some laws of the Torah are rational, but some such as the dietary prohibitions and the purity taboos are not. In fact, it's precisely because they are non-rational and thus not universally observed that they serve to separate Israel from other nations, to particularize Israel, make her different, not unite all of humanity. So the, the Mosaic law is also not transhistorical. It's given to a community at a particular point in its history. And because it is historically embedded and contingent, it is adjusted as circumstances change. Deuteronomy 17 provides the process by which new rulings can be rendered as new situations arise in historical time. Numbers 27 contains the most obvious example of the contingent and historically responsive character of the biblical divine law. When the daughters of Tzalafachat argue that they should be allowed to inherit their dead father, God says, you know, you're right. We really should change things so that daughters inherit when there are no sons. Moses make a note of that and the law is changed. So in the dominant biblical discourse of divine law, the divine law is written legislation for a particular historical community, not universal humankind. It's embedded in history and therefore historically responsive and contingent. And this conception of divine law stands in stark contrast to the prevailing and largely stoic conception of divine law as an unwritten rational order embedded in nature um, and therefore transhistorical and absolute. Now these two distinctive discourses of divine law, as I described in my last book, they collided head on after Alexander's conquest of the Eastern end of the Mediterranean, and they created a cognitive dissonance for Jews living under Hellenistic rule from the third century BCE on. Why did they feel a cognitive dissonance? 
because on the face of it, the divine law of biblical tradition possessed none of the features in column A of that chart that I showed you. It possessed the features in column B, the features that Greek thought attributed to human law, not divine law. And this mismatch between the Greek and the biblical conceptions of divine law was obvious to ancient Jews, and they responded to the cognitive dissonance in different ways. Now, my, my newest work argues that these responses can best be illuminated by humor theory. The most widely accepted theory of humor is the incongruity theory of humor, which holds that humor is found primarily in an intellectual recognition of an absurd incongruity between conflicting ideas or experiences. According to John Morial, humor is a cognitive phenomenon, intellectual, in which perceptions, thoughts, mental patterns, and expectations undergo a change of cognitive state or a cognitive shift that's abrupt or sudden, but also pleasurable, not disturbing. So he summarizes these four features in this concise statement. In humor, we enjoy cognitive shifts. Now his theory of humor improves on standard incongruity theory by explaining why we don't all laugh at the same incongruities and we don't laugh at all incongruities. Not all cognitive shifts or incongruities are experienced by everyone as pleasurable. Morial explains that there are two basic human responses to incongruity. The first is negative. It's a negative reaction that can range from distress and fear to puzzlement. So great distress arises when we perceive an incongruity as a dangerous threat to ourselves, like finding a bomb on the front seat of your car. That's an incongruity that would not make you laugh. Or a threat to our values, like seeing a parent beat her child in, in public. These incongruities are not funny. They're frightening or they're distressing. Some incongruities may not, however, be perceived as dangerous or threatening, but they're still odd and they create puzzlement. Um, like when I found a set of my house keys on the curb outside my house. Why were they there? How did they get there? Um, it created a feeling of uneasiness and curiosity and I wanted to figure it out. Whether dangerous or merely puzzling, if these incongruities frighten us or irritate us, uh, we don't find them amusing and we work to eliminate them if they're dangerous or to resolve them and figure them out and stop the puzzlement if they are puzzling. Those are the negative responses to incongruity, but there's also a positive human response to incongruity when an incongruity is perceived as non-threatening, non-perplexing, then we can enjoy it. And far from wanting to eliminate it or resolve it, we are amused and we want to prolong it and repeat it. Now, incongruity has always provoked and continues to provoke these basic categories of response in human beings. What constitutes incongruity is sometimes culturally specific, but once we identify incongruity in a particular cultural context, we can look for clues to determine whether that incongruity is perceived as disturbing or puzzling or as amusing and enjoyable. And one clue is whether it's actively eliminated or actively prolonged and repeated. Sometimes one group in a culture will react to an incongruity with distress and work to eliminate it, while another group will react to the same incongruity with humorous delight and seek to prolong it and intensify it. And the contrast tells us who is threatened by the incongruity and who is not. So if we come back to the ancients, ancient Jews could not help but be aware of the incongruity between the Hellenistic conception of divine law as a transhistorical and absolute logos, and the biblical conception of divine law as a historically embedded and contingent written legislation. For Jews who embraced and internalized Hellenistic culture and the Hellenistic conception of divine law, this incongruity was not amusing. It was embarrassing, it was distressing, and it had to be eliminated. So starting in the third century BCE, we have Hellenistic Jewish writings which place Jewish protagonists in dialogue with Gentile figures who are either puzzled by or who mock and ridicule the incongruous divine law of the Jews, especially the irrational parts, the dietary laws and the purity taboos. The Jewish protagonists response in these fictional dialogues is to deny the incongruity. So in the letter of Aristeas, for example, 
the Jewish author portrays foreign philosophers puzzling over the Jewish dietary laws and purity taboos because they contradict the law of, of nature, or they contradict both nature and reason. And a divine law shouldn't do that. A divine law is the natural reason. Um, but the Jewish hero responds that the Mosaic legislation was not laid down at random or by some caprice of the mind, but with a view to truth, Aletheia, and as a token of right reason, orthos logos, as an allegorical understanding reveals. And then he goes on to reveal that. Similarly, in 4th Maccabees, when a Gentile tyrant mocks the dietary laws as senseless and unnatural and tries to get the Jewish figure to violate them, the Jewish protagonist responds, you scoff at our philosophy, philosophia, as though our living by it were not sensible, eulogistia, rational. But believing that the law is divine, we know that the creator of the world shows us sympathy by imposing a law that is in accordance with nature and that teaches the four cardinal virtues. The first century Alexandrian Jewish philosopher Philo is also sensitive to those who ridicule scripture as possessing features that are incongruous for a law that claims to be divine. Explicitly signaling his anger and his distress at these mockers, Philo also denies the incongruity. He vehemently asserts that the Mosaic law delivered at Sinai is divine according to the criteria accepted by the broader Hellenistic environment. In fact, he says, all of the particular enactments, if you examine the particular enactments, you will find that they seek to attain to the harmony of the universe and are in agreement with the principles of nature. And having identified the Mosaic law at Sinai with the divine natural law of Stoic tradition, he goes on to show that it possesses the properties and the qualities of Stoic natural law. First, as allegorical readings will demonstrate, it contains rational and philosophical truth. In it, he says in this last quote, you will not find anything mythical or fictional, but the canons of truth all inscribed. Second, he says, biblical divine law is not the law of a particular people, but the universal law of the entire world city. And one day all nations will lay down their particular laws and follow the universal natural law currently observed by the Jews. Third, he asserts rather astonishingly that the law is immutable, never having changed from the time of its receipt by Moses. And fourth, he argues that writtenness, he's, he's aware that Writtenness is an unfailing sign of human law in the Hellenistic uh, world. So he asserts that this written text is actually just a copy of an original unwritten law of nature. So for Philo and other Hellenized Jews who accepted the Hellenistic definition of divine law, the incongruity between the Greek idea of divine law and the biblical representation of divine law was distressing and it had to be eliminated by refashioning, refashioning the historically embedded and contingent divine Torah of Moses as the trans-historical and absolute natural law of Greek philosophical tradition. But not all Jews reacted negatively to this obvious incongruity. And in my last book, I argued, and I'll just review this briefly, the Talmudic rabbis who flourished from the late first to the seventh century in both Palestine and, and then Babylonia were also aware of this incongruity and they were generally speaking unapologetic. We know this because they too composed dialogues and stories that depict outsiders mocking those elements of the Mosaic legislation that appeared to them to be incongruous for a divine law and therefore laughable. But unlike the Hellenistic Jewish writings that we've seen, the rabbis were less distressed by this mockery and they didn't rush to remove the incongruity by asserting that the law of Moses was transhistorical, universal, immutable, rational truth. In fact, instead of refashioning the Torah of Moses to match the Hellenistic conception of divine or natural law as Philo did, the rabbis signaled their rejection of this conception by doubling down on the incongruity, treating it with humor, prolonging and even intensifying it. Against prevailing Hellenistic conceptions of divine law, they reasserted the biblical conception of divine law as a written body of legislation given at a historical time and place that is not universal, it's not immutable, rational truth. And the resulting portrait of divine law as sometimes deviating from truth and rationality, sometimes in need of updating and repair, can be pretty funny to those who are aware of the Hellenistic alternative that it is seeking to undermine. And that's precisely, I would argue, how the rabbis wanted it, because humor 
is one of the most effective weapons for dismantling a misplaced reverence for the immutable and the absolute. And so in defiance of those who would equate the divine law with truth, um, the dominant trend in rabbinic sources, particularly earlier sources, um, is to characterize the Torah as, as not conforming to certain standards of truth. On literally, literally hundreds of occasions, the rabbis will go to the trouble of pointing out specific details of divine law that do not accord with formal logic, as well as divine judgments that seem to pervert judicial truth and acquit the guilty through an overabundance of mercy. Now, the results can be humorous, <clears throat> particularly when God engages in various tricks to circumvent truth or certain subterfuges to avoid carrying out a just punishment. In one case, God stops the angels of justice seeking to punish Israel for the sin of the golden calf by digging a hole under his throne so that Moses can make a quick getaway and get rid of the calf, which is the incriminating evidence. In other cases, God blatantly undermines the procedures of the heavenly court in order to acquit those he loves, all to humorous effect. In another passage, God prays apparently to himself that the attribute of mercy will defeat his attribute of true justice when judging his children Israel. So when it comes to the law, truth can be destructive and must sometimes be defeated. Neither do the laws of the divine Torah necessarily align with the natural order or objective reality. And here the rabbinic view differs not only from Stoic natural law theory, but from the approach of earlier Jewish sectarian groups, such as the community at Qumran. That community, for instance, uh, insisted that the, the divine calendar must align with the actual movements of the heavenly bodies, which are determined by the positive commands of God. They likewise insisted that certain divine commandments, such as monogamy, are confirmed and ordained by the created natural order of one man, one woman. But in contrast to the sectarian approach, the dominant rabbinic conception of the divine law may be described as nominalist. In a nominalist approach, Law does not necessarily reflect a natural or objective reality, and the rabbis frequently deploy strategies typical of a nominalist orientation to the law that can cause the law to veer from objective reality when there is good reason. For, for example, they famously set the calendar in defiance of astronomical reality in some cases. In determining the law, they sometimes rely on legal fictions and contrary to fact presumptions that strain credulity and lead to absurd results. Now, the view of law as nominalist is not essentially determined by natural facts, is not in itself surprising in a system of human law, but that a divine law should be so would be utterly incongruous and quite distressing to one who holds that divine law by definition should align with and express an objective or natural reality or truth. But the dominant voice in rabbinic literature found it kind of funny to think of divine law as deviating from rational, judicial, or natural truth. We must be satisfied with just one example, one brief example um, concerning the fixing of the calendar. And this is a passage from Pasikta Rabati. Rabbi Hoshaya taught, when the lower earthly court makes a de decree and declares today is the new year, right? They give a ruling about the sighting of the moon and that today is the new year. Then the Holy One, blessed be he, says to the ministering angels, set up the heavenly tribunal, install the advocate, install the clerk of the court for the lower court has decreed and declared that tomorrow is the new year. So we have to do so also. But if the witnesses are delayed or the earthly court reconsiders and puts it off to the next day, the Holy One, blessed be he, says to the angels, oh, take down the tribunal and dismiss the advocate and the clerk of the court for the lower court has decreed that the next morning should be the new year. Rabbi Pinchas and Rabbi Hilkiah and Rabbi Shimon say, when all the ministering angels assemble before God and ask, Lord of the universe, when is the new year? He answers them, you're asking me, you and I should ask the lower court. Uh, I hope you're smiling and laughing because this incongruous portrait of ministering angels waiting around for the human court to declare the calendar, where at Qumran they were saying, don't ever declare the, the calendar until the, the heavenly bodies have, have made it clear what it is. But here they reverse that and uh, the angels are waiting around for the human court to declare the calendar and they busily prepare to issue a ruling in accordance with the ruling of the earthly court, only to close up shop when that ruling is not forthcoming as if time depends on the actions of mortals, not to mention the portrait of a fallible divine being who literally doesn't have a clue what time it is, 
This is not threatening to the rabbis, but, but funny. Similarly, as I argued at length in my last book, the rabbis seem to feel no distress comparable to that of Hellenistic Jewish writers over the fact that the divine law does contain some non-rational or irrational provisions. And indeed, they intensify this feature at times. They gratuitously turn rational laws into irrational laws. They will often say, you know, logically the law should be X, but scripture says it's not X, which isn't rational, but what can we do? It's the decree of the king, meaning it's arbitrary and we obey it anyway. Nor are they distressed by the fact that the law is not immutable. Here again, they sometimes double down and portray the laws of the Torah as susceptible to moral critique and modification. And God is sometimes needing correction and instruction from his human subjects, again, usually to humorous effect. So I would like to suggest, and this is what I'm suggesting as I, as I move forward in my work. I'd like to suggest that the rabbi's opposition to the prevailing Hellenistic construction of divine law as a transhistorical absolute can be organized under the figure of the jester. In his essay, The Priest and the Jester, Lyshak Kolakowski proposes the jester as representing an attitude of negative vigilance in the face of any absolute. I am quoting here from his essay, The Priest and the Jester. The antagonism between a philosophy consolidating the absolute and a philosophy questioning the accepted absolutes appears to be incurable. It is the antagonism of a priest and a jester. And in almost every historical epoch, the priest is the guardian of the absolute who upholds the cult of the final and the obvious contained in the tradition. The jester is he who questions what appears to be self-evident. The philosophy of the jester denounces as doubtful what appears as unshakable. It points out the contradictions in what seems evident and incontestable. It ridicules common sense and it reads sense into the absurd. The jester's attitude is an endless attempt to reflect on the various arguments of contradictory ideas, an attitude dialectical by its very nature, simply to overcome what is because it is. A jester does not jeer out of sheer contrariness. He jeers because he mistrusts the stabilized world. So I've argued that humor and incongruity played an important role in the rabbi's attempt to resist and even dismantle prevailing notions of some transhistorical, static, immutable divine law. But to stop here, which is where I stopped in my last book, is to give only a negative account of the rabbis as deconstructing the prevailing view in their ambient culture. Can we provide a positive account of the rabbinic conception of divine law, focusing not on what it isn't, but on what it is? Well, till now, I think scholars of divine law have failed to do so. Indeed, scholarship on the concept of natural or divine law in the West has generally ignored the Talmudic conception of divine law because it just appears to lack what is taken to be the defining quality of divine law, a static, transhistorical immutability. In addition, because modern Western scholarship on divine law generally resides in the discipline of Western philosophy, deploying analytical canons that privilege the transhistorical and the absolute, uh, it views the rabbinic conception of a historically embedded and contingent divine law as quaint and unsophisticated at best, illogical, wrongheaded, or irrelevant at worst. So in the time that remains, I will argue that to produce a positive account of the rabbinic conception of, of divine law as more than a destabilizing resistance movement, we need theoretical models and analytical tools other than those provided by the Western philosophical tradition. We need theoretical models in which the historical and the contingent are not irrelevant and inferior categories, but central and essential. I will argue that these tools and models are provided by contemporary performance studies and play theory. Because they privilege the historical and the contingent, these theoretical approaches enable a robust account of the rabbinic conception of divine law and the underlying epistemology on which it's based. So to state the case more plainly, if in biblical and rabbinic tradition, divine law is not a static and transhistorical absolute, but a particular and contingent body of legislation responsive to and generative of the perpetual dynamism of the world of generation and decay in which we live, then it is performative. And for this reason, the theoretical lens offered by contemporary performance studies 
can illuminate the rabbinic conception of divine law. Now, performance studies values performance, which consists of action as an object of study in itself. According to Richard Schechner, the field considers a performance to be any action that is framed, presented, highlighted, or displayed. Performing assumes both an audience and a consciousness that one is showing or performing. Performance can occur outside of formal performance contexts. And performativity is a term that refers to events and actions, even everyday actions that have performance-like qualities. And so performance studies holds that many activities can be analyzed as performance. They can be interrogated in terms of their performativity. Now the rabbinic elaboration of divine law in the Talmud can be interrogated in terms of its performativity. And the following text may serve as a brief example. Now here in this text, a woman poses a question about a blood stain. Is it menstrual blood? And therefore she's impure and disqualified, disqualified for sexual relations with her husband, or is it not? A woman once came to Rabbi Akiva and said to him, I have observed a blood stain, and I don't know whether it's menstrual blood. And he said to her, did you perhaps have a wound? And she said, yes, but it scabbed over. He said to her, well, is it possible that it opened again and bled? And she said, yes. And so Rabbi Akiva declared her pure. When he saw that his disciples looked at one another in astonishment, he said, why do you find this difficult? Since the sages did not lay down the rule in order to be stringent, but in order to be lenient. For scripture says, if a woman has a flow and her flow in her flesh be blood, meaning only flowing blood is of legal consequence, not a blood stain. Now, when this story begins, we think we're alone in witnessing a private dialogue between Rabbi Akiva and a woman, but we suddenly discover that we're not uh, um, the only observers here. Others are watching and their gaze confirms the status of Rabbi Akiva's interaction with the woman as a performance. We identify with our fellow observers. We take a seat in the audience with them and we find that their reaction to the performance informs ours. They are astonished and we understand that we too should be astonished. But why? What is astonishing about Rabbi Akiva's performance of the law? The situation described is a situation of doubt. The status of the woman's bloodstain as menstrual or non-menstrual in origin really cannot be determined as a matter of fact. And so a legal presumption is required. Rabbi Akiva adopts the presumption that the blood is non-menstrual based on some far-fetched witness leading that strains credulity. Then, in what seems very much like an after-the-fact justification, Rabbi Akiva offers a scriptural support for the policy of adopting lenient presumptions in cases involving blood stains rather than fresh blood. Rabbi Akiva, in other words, steps outside the known boundary of the law and then pulls the boundary up after him so that he is no longer outside it. The amazed disciples who have recruited us to their ranks serve as a literary device by means of which the author of the text highlights and champions the highly performative, I printed this down the bottom of the text, the highly performative, contingent, dynamic, and generative nature of Rabbi Akiva's elaboration of the divine law. And some readers try to normalize what Rabbi Akiva did. I think they're simply not reading the text, which prompts us to be amazed and scandalized like the students. The rabbis were keenly aware that the presence of disciples rendered their every move a performance that could make or unmake the law. Consider another story. Now this one is from the Babylonian Talmud and the law in question concerns the proper posture to be assumed for the twice daily recitation of the Shema prayer. Now, according to the school of Hillel, the prayer must be recited standing, I'm sorry, it may be recited standing, sitting or reclining. While according to the school of Shammai, one must recite the prayer in the morning standing and in the evening reclining. So the Talmud tells us then of two early rabbis who were dining together when the time came to recite the evening prayer. Uh, once Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah were dining at the same place and Rabbi Ishmael was reclining while Rabbi Elazar was standing upright. When the time came for reciting the evening prayer, Rabbi, Eliezer, Rabbi Elazar reclined and Rabbi Ishmael stood upright. Said Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah to Rabbi Ishmael, Brother Ishmael, are you simply being contrary, right? As long as I was upright, you were reclining. And now that I recline, you stand upright. He replied, 
I have acted according to the rule of the school of Hillel and you have acted according to the rule of the school of Shammai. And what is more, I had to act thus, lest the disciples should see and fix the law according to the opinion of the school of Shammai for future generations. In other words, both rabbis changed the positions they were in. Rabbi Elazar, who was standing, reclines, which happens to be permitted by both schools. After which Rabbi Ishmael, who was reclining, stands. Now, if Rabbi Ishmael follows the view of the school of Hillel, surely he could have just remained reclining. They both could have been reclining since the school of Hillel allows any position. Why then did he stand? The answer has to do with the potential gaze of a potential audience and a desire to communicate that the law is undecided. Were Rabbi Ishmael to remain reclining, which according to his view is permitted, an observer might think that since both the rabbis are now reclining, the law has been decided in accordance with the opinion of the school of Shammai and one must recline. So to, pre to prevent this, Rabbi Ishmael stands to indicate to a group of onlookers off stage, not that the school of Hillel is right exactly, the text doesn't say he wants to recruit converts to uh, his position on the law, but rather um, that this law, like so many others he wants to communicate, has not been resolved. There's no singular absolute position and he needs to perform that. Rabbi Akiva's performance of the law in the previous text created something new. Rabbi Ishmael's performance prevented the erasure of one legal view. In other words, both performances do something. They have an effect in the world. And this resonates with the concept of the performative as described by J.L. Austin in How to Do Things with Words. The central idea being the concept of the performative, the, I'm sorry, the central idea behind the concept of the performative is that language can actually do things with this ring I thee wed, actually creates a marriage and transforms a single person into a married person. The transformative quality of what John Searle calls speech acts is expressed by performance theorists as efficacy. The ability of speech, language, and performative events and actions to effect change. A law is by its very nature highly performative, creating and transforming realities through speech acts and other behaviors that are framed and executed in a manner that is deemed efficacious. Divine law in rabbinic tradition is no different. And this brings us to an additional and central theme of performance studies, which we can add to our earlier list of the themes of performance studies. So that was the list we had before, and now I've added at the bottom, the relation of performance to the real and to truth. This question has a long history with distinct approaches that may be grouped in two very broad categories for our purposes. And please forgive this reductive sketch. According to one approach, performance is mimetic. It's a reflection, a mimesis, imitation, a reflection or imitation of a stable and transhistorical reality. Performance is an unreal illusion that only points to reality and truth beyond it. Plato, the champion of truth, famously banned all actors and poets from his ideal republic because they trade in lies. For Plato, the ordinary reality that we live in is already a shadow of the ideal and transhistorical forms of the real and the true. So theater as an imitation or mimesis of those shadows is at a second remove from all that is real and true. Aristotle was kinder to the theater and its ability to reflect reality. But this idea that theater imitates or reflects and expresses a separate true reality was a dominant idea from ancient Greece to Renaissance Europe. In order to expose the truth of his uncle's fratricide, Hamlet proposes that a play be performed, exclaiming, the play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. In his role as director, Hamlet tells the players that the purpose of playing was and is to hold, as it were, the mirror up to nature. Such expressive or representational theories of performance assign performance on the one hand and life or nature to different orders of reality. There's a hierarchy of reality. Life and nature are primary and real. Performance and art are secondary and imitative. But according to a second approach to performance, reality is not a stable and static thing. Reality itself is a dynamic process and therefore reality is not reflected by performance, but constructed through it. 
performance constructs reality. Postmodernism has done away with the distinction between authentic reality out there and performance in historical time, issuing in the collapse of Plato's categories and hierarchies of reality. For post-structuralists, every action, every idea is a process and a performance. So instead of the stable representation of static originals, there is only dynamic performance generating provisional meanings. Paraphrasing Hamlet, Brecht says, art is not a mirror held up to nature, but a hammer with which to shape it. When performance is not about reflecting or expressing some objective truth, but creating it, then performance becomes a kind of play. It's no accident that performances are called plays. Play is a form of activity that despite possessing clear rules and structure is under, undetermined in its outcome and exists only as long as there are players to sustain it. I submit that the classical rabbinic corpus of divine law, the Babylonian Talmud with its famously labyrinthine legal discussions is best understood in terms of performance, a dynamic activity that generates provisional meanings rather than unveiling absolute truths, and play, a structured activity with an undetermined outcome. First of all, the Talmud's arguments are staged like a performance. A ringmaster or a puppeteer, the anonymous voice of the Talmud that we refer to as the Stam, this anonymous narrator, controls a diverse set of characters Rabbinic figures from diverse times and places are set on the stage by the stam and made to interact and perform. They speak, they object, they respond to objections, they draw inferences, they register agreement or disagreement. And as we shall see in a moment, they bring new things into being. But these highly choreographed performances are also a kind of play in which the stam deploys an ever increasing level of detail and specificity in a concerted effort to destabilize knowledge, to undermine certainty, to defer final answers, and to keep the game going. I'm going to offer two examples, one that is patently funny and the other that's entirely serious. And if your head spins, that's okay because it will just prove my final point. Um, Jan, I don't know if you want to um, spotlight me because I'm not going to be using the uh, the screen share PowerPoint and I'm going to be throwing some stuff at people kind of quickly. So it's up to you. It's your choice. But in um, one Talmudic discussion, a certain rabbi says that a sukkah, the ceremonial hut that's constructed for the observance of a particular holiday, may be constructed using an animal for one of the three required walls. Now, another sage, Rabbi Meir, prohibits this. Now, it's fine. You do not have to follow the ins and outs of the argument. I want you to hear the performance of the argument. That's what's more important. Okay. So one sage permits it, and Rabbi Meir prohibits it. Why? Two sages living two centuries later and hundreds of miles away suggest reasons. One says that Rebbe Meir fears that the animal will run away, but another says Rebbe Meir fear, fears that it might die. The stum, the, the anonymous voice orchestrating this discussion asks how these two different understandings of the reason for Rebbe Meir's prohibition might lead to different rulings in different situations. And now the game is afoot. The stum responds to its own question. Well, what if someone builds a sukkah using an elephant who is tied up as one of the walls? If Rabbi Meir prohibits animal walls because he fears the animal will wander off, well, this animal is tied. So Rabbi Meir would permit this animal walled sukkah. But if Rabbi Meir prohibits animal walls because he fears the animal will die, this animal might die, so he would prohibit this sukkah. But the stam isn't done. Perhaps Rabbi Meir's fear of the animal dying wouldn't apply in the case of an elephant, because an elephant is so large that even when dead, its carcass will still meet the minimum height required for a wall to be a valid sukkah wall. So maybe he would permit the case of the tied elephant, whether the reason for his prohibition is fear the animal will run or fear the animal will die. A wall made from a tied elephant is therefore not the case where we would get a different ruling depending on the reason we assign to Rabbi Meir's prohibition. Maybe Knowing the reason for his view matters in the case of a non-elephant quadruped, like a cow. Now a cow is smaller, and if it dies, its carcass will not reach the minimum height required for a wall to be a valid sukkah wall. So if Rabbi Meir's prohibition is based on a fear the animal will die and fall below the minimum height, he would invalidate this sukkah. But if his prohibition is based on a fear the animal will run away, this animal, if tied, will not run away, and he would validate this sukkah. 
Well, not so fast. What if, asks the stam, the owner suspends the cow from the ceiling? Then if it dies, it will not crumple to the ground. It will meet the minimum height required of a valid wall. So maybe even according to the view that Rabbi Meir prohibits animal walls for fear the animal will die and be too short, maybe he would validate this sukkah because a suspended dead cow will be tall enough. Well, that's possible, the stan continues, but if the owner suspends the dead cow, there will be spaces between its legs and a wall isn't a wall if it has large gaps. So Rabbi Meir would prohibit this suspended dead cow wall. Well, the stam notes, the owner could always stuff the spaces with palm and bay branches. True, the stam responds to itself, but carcasses tend to shrink. What if this dead cow's suspended carcass shrinks just enough to create a gap between the top of the animal wall and the ceiling? Well, we generally say a gap of up to three or four hand breadths doesn't disqualify a wall, and maybe the owner took shrinkage into account, suspending the cow close enough that even with shrinkage, the gap will be less than four hand breadths. Well, that's possible, the stam responds, but, but what if the owner, in good faith, just miscalculated the amount of shrinkage of a cow carcass. And perhaps Rabbi Meir's prohibition of an animal walled sukkah was designed and even limited to this one specific case. Perhaps in all other cases, he would actually permit an animal walled sukkah. Determining the law depends on particular contingent details. Now this passage demonstrates the basic features of a performance, a series of unrelated teachings and opinions are pronounced miles and centuries apart and they are the characters in a dialectical drama that's staged by the stam. The performance evinces a spirit of play, not just because of the humus, humorous subject matter, although that helps, but because of, of certain formal features, the endless what-ifs that propose limiting Rabbi Meir's prohibition to certain specific situations. This kind of limitation is called an okimta, right? a hypothetical limitation. It applies only in this case, an okimta. Maybe his prohibition was limited to a certain kind of animal in a certain situation. What if it's an elephant? What if it dies or runs away? What if the law is different for a non-elephant quadruped? What if the animal were suspended so we don't have to worry about maintaining the height of the wall if it dies? What if the owner doesn't calculate the proper amount of shrinkage of the carcass so we do have to worry? And on and on. The game continues because as is true of any game, the real fun is in the playing. And although the Talmud stops where it stops, there's no genuine and sense of closure. I don't know at the end which reason for his prohibition is correct. And there's nothing to prevent us from coming up with yet another contingent detail. What if it's an unbound animal that's trained to stay put, even without being tied? Would Rebbe Meir permit, permit that? The debate is potentially infinite because particularity and contingency are infinite. Every day, new things pass away and new things come into being that may not as yet be within the circle of the law. We also yeah, see here, yeah. whoops, I think we need somebody to mute. Yeah. We also see here the element of performativity or efficacy of making things and shaping reality. The complicated objections, the hypothetical limitations or okintas, they shape and reshape the teachings and the disputes. Opinions that appear to disagree categorically may actually agree in all but the rarest of cases if we introduce enough conditions. We thought that all animal walled sukkahs were categorically prohibited by Rabbi Meir and categorically permitted by his colleague Rabbi Yehuda. But it turns out that according to one understanding of the reason for Rabbi Meir's view, he would permit an animal walled sukkah as long as the animal's tied. And even on a different understanding of the reason for his view, his prohibition is limited to the case of a bound non-elephant quadruped with branches stuffed between its legs suspended from above whose owner may have miscalculated the degree of shrinkage experienced by its carcass. So what we thought was so at the beginning we find is not necessarily so at the end and suddenly we are a little less certain of ourselves. And the Talmud doesn't ask so which view of Rabbi Meir is right. It's interested only in which views of Rabbi Meir are possible. Now you might say this discussion is a parody Surely serious Talmudic discussions of the law are serious attempts to reach certain knowledge, a single truth. So let me make my case with a, a shorter but entirely sober example, typical of literally thousands of Talmudic discussions. We have a passage in the Talmud. Again, the details do not have to detain you. Just listen to the flow of the argument. A passage in Bava Metziah, which discusses the legal acquisition of that which enters one, one's courtyard or the four square cubit space around one. The general principle here is that a courtyard and your four cubit space um, around you 
um, are viewed as extensions of your hand and they affect acquisition for you. Now our ringmaster, the stum, asks whether a minor girl, like an adult, legally acquires objects by, mean of her, by means of her courtyard and her four cubit space. Uh, Rach Lakish, a third century rabbi, says a minor girl does not, and his colleague Rabbi Yochanan says a minor girl does. And these seem to be categorical positions. To explain their disagreement, the Stam suggests that they have different ideas of how the courtyard is an extension of the hand. Perhaps Rabbi Yochanan holds that a courtyard affects acquisition like my hand in a physical sense. It holds an object. Since a minor girl can acquire things by taking them physically with her hand, he thinks she can acquire things with her courtyard. Perhaps Rish Lakish holds that a courtyard affects acquisition like my hand in a metaphorical sense. My hand is like an agent commissioned to act on my behalf. And so a courtyard acquires objects for me like an agent. Since a minor cannot appoint an agent, Rish Lakish holds, that she cannot acquire with her courtyard. There is a lengthy discussion that I will not take you through that ensues questioning whether a courtyard acquires like a hand in a physical sense or a hand in a metaphorical sense and biblical verses are cited and teachings from sages in different periods and lands are adduced and there are objections and, and more objections and so on. But when we finally get to a point where it seems that Rabbi Yochanan may be the winner and the game is over, it's clear that the Talmud isn't interested in declaring a winner or ending the game with a single final answer. And so surprise, the passage makes a 180 degree turn and three limitations, okimtas, are proposed, which completely redefine the original dispute. The first of our three proposed okimtas limits the disagreement to a narrow circumstance. Perhaps they actually agree that the girl's courtyard acquires like a physical hand in the case of a divorce document or a get. And they only disagreed in the case of a found object. One of them holds that uh, you can derive the case of the found object from the get, and the other says you can't. Well, no sooner is that okimta articulated, narrowing their dispute just to the case of a found object, we get a second okimta, according to which the two sages agree that her courtyard acquires both her divorce document and her found object. Where they disagree is on the law for a minor boy. Well, this is odd um, because the two sages' statements were explicitly formulated in the feminine form, but never mind, there's more. While the first okimta limited the dispute based on the kind of object that was acquired, a divorce document or a found object, and the second uh, limitation limited their dispute based on the subject of the law, a minor girl versus a minor boy, the third limitation or okimta now comes and combines the two and concludes perhaps there was no disagreement at all. Perhaps Reish Lakish was talking about a minor boy whose courtyard does not acquire a found object, and Rabbi Yochanan was talking about a minor girl whose courtyard does acquire a divorce document. In other words, if you plunge into the details, you see that one may have been talking about chalk and the other about cheese, and each would completely agree with the other's teaching on the other topic, and poof, the dispute, which was enough to generate nearly three pages of detailed argumentation and a slew of ever more precise and detailed limitations simply vanishes like magic. We thought that Rabbi Yochanan permitted a minor girl to acquire by her courtyard and that Reish Lakish prohibited the same, but it turns out that what we thought was so at the beginning is not necessarily so at the end, and perhaps with a few more okintos, things would look different again. The scholarly consensus is that the Talmud's excessive argumentation and endless piling up of detailed distinctions is designed to bring more certainty, to uncover truth, to achieve episteme, knowledge, but I disagree. I believe it is designed to bring less certainty, and I submit that it does so quite intentionally. And to understand this claim requires a consideration of my final point on the epistemological function of detail. So if you can give me just three more minutes, um, I will explain this final point. For all their difference, the theories of knowledge propounded by Plato and Aristotle had this in common. For both, the object of true knowledge is the universal form or essence rather than the particular substance. Aristotle's theory of knowledge has a greater respect for sensory perception than does Plato's theory because Aristotle's theory begins with the experience of particular substances in this world. I come to know what horse is by encountering lots of different horses. Um, but from those encounters with particular substances, we abstract the universal 
non-contingent form or essence of that thing, which is the object of our true knowledge. The particular details of a substance are a function of its matter, its material substratum, the fact that it's brown or white or tall or short. Those features may distinguish that substance from other particular substances in its class, but those details do not contribute to an apprehension of the universal form that unites and defines the whole class and is the object of true knowledge. Indeed, those details must be suppressed when seeking to identify and abstract the common form or essence that unites a group of particular substances and imparts true or certain knowledge. Greek epistemology aims at a unity beyond diversity. It thinks of a preoccupation with detail as an impediment to the acquisition of true and certain knowledge. To know what a horse is, I have to transcend the particular details of different colors and sizes and speeds and functions of brown horses and white horses and dapple horses and slow horses and lame horses. I have to get away from those particulars and abstract from them the form or essence of horseness to have a true knowledge of what a horse is. So this is my claim. My claim is if the priests of Greek epistemology sought to stabilize knowledge and certainty through abstraction from detail. The jesters of Talmudic epistemology sought to destabilize knowledge and certainty through distraction with detail in the conviction that truth refers not to an instantaneous unveiling of some transhistorical one, but a continuous historically embedded and generative process of contingent interpretation. So to conclude, the elaboration of divine law in the Talmud is both performance and play, and it's a very specific kind of play. It's the kind of play featured in a comical magic show where every okimta is a wink and the anonymous stam is a jester, magician, and illusionist, incongruously conjuring and banishing objects to the audience's delight. To paraphrase Hamlet, the play is the thing, not because it is nature's mirror reflecting a truer reality, but because the play is the thing, the only reality. And if reality is to continue, the play, the game must continue and must be infinite. I allude here to John Carse's description of finite and infinite games. And I observe that the Talmud is best observed, best understood as the latter. A finite game is played for the purpose of winning, an infinite game for the purpose of continuing play. The rules of a finite game are the contractual terms by which the players can agree on who has won. The rules of an infinite game change during the course of play to prevent anyone from winning the game and to bring as many persons as possible into the play. To be serious is to press for a specified conclusion. To be playful is to allow for possibility, whatever the cost to oneself. Kolakowski offered the figure of the jester standing in opposition to the priest who is the emblem and guardian of the absolute. I've argued that reading the rabbis under the sign of the jester lays the groundwork for a reassessment of the rabbinic conception of divine law as taking aim at the priestly guardians of an immutable divine logos against the privileging of the transhistorical as divine. The rabbis engaged in a performance of divine law that deployed the destabilizing strategies of play. These strategies include humor, which delights in incongruity, and dialectical excess and detail, which resist containment and defer finitude, resisting a transhistorical divine law with its attendant moral and epistemological certainty in the name of a historically embedded divine law with its attendant contingency and dynamism to meet the needs of the new day may be seen as the Talmud's infinite and impertinent jest. Thank you so much for your attention. I know that was a very long time to be sitting and staring at a screen, um, but I'm happy to entertain questions.